Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel and this is Nightline. His name is Louis Farrakhan and he leads a black Muslim sect known as the Nation of Islam. He's also a friend of Jesse Jackson and when a black reporter for the Washington Post reported Jackson's use of the word Jaime, Farrakhan called the reporter a traitor and threatened him with death. We'll talk tonight with Louis Farrakhan, with journalist and commentator Roger Wilkins, and with ABC News correspondent Kenneth Walker, who is covering the Jackson campaign. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from New York, Ted Koppel. Let the record show that in tomorrow morning's Washington Post, black Muslim leader Louis Farrakhan is quoted as denying that he ever threatened the life of Washington Post reporter Milton Coleman. Let the record also show that on March 11th, speaking on a radio broadcast from Chicago, Mr. Farrakhan made what certainly sounded like a threat on Mr. Coleman's life. But in a moment, you'll hear that for yourselves. Why is this of any importance to anyone but the two men most directly involved? because Louis Farrakhan is a man of influence, and as Nightline correspondent Betsy Aaron reports, he and the Reverend Jesse Jackson are close friends. J-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E. let us stand for the next president of the United States, the Reverend Jesse Louis Jackson. They are friends, one a candidate for president of the United States, the other black Muslim Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam a black nationalist organization which believes in black superiority, its position taken as a reaction to what it terms white racism in American society. We have been saddled down with an inferiority feeling. We don't think generally that black folk should rule themselves, much less anyone else. In the last month, Farrakhan has attacked and threatened Jews in general and one black reporter in particular, all in defense of Jesse Jackson's candidacy. Jackson's Rainbow Coalition has never been peopled with large numbers of Jews. When a Washington Post reporter revealed Jackson's use of the word Jaime for Jew and Jaime Town for New York, this is what followed. Angry calls for explanations and apologies from Jewish leaders. And then an initial denial, and then defense from Jackson. And this from Mr. Farrakhan. I say to the Jewish people, who may not like our brother, it is not Jesse Jackson that you're attacking. When you attack him, you attack the millions that are lining up with him. You're attacking all of us. But if you harm this brother, I warn you in the name of Allah, this will be the last one you harm. Then in a nationally broadcast message on the Nation of Islam radio program, Farrakhan took on that Washington Post reporter, Milton Coleman. Coleman is black. Don't tell me nothing about you a reporter. You a nigger in the eyes of white people. Do you understand what I'm saying? I said, but we're going to make an example of Milton Coleman. One day soon, we will punish you with death. We're going to punish the traitor and make the traitor beg for forgiveness. We use a threat to intimidate rather than one to, uh, to, uh, that really would be a serious one to take uh, Mr. Coleman's life. Professor Lawrence Mamaya says Farrakhan's threats are in keeping with his charismatic style. When a reporter, when a black reporter um, turns against, in a sense, uh, Louis Farrakhan's champion, political champion, uh, he feels a need to chastise that reporter, to single him out, and to let him know that he ought to come around, that uh, he should not be destroying the unity uh, that black people need at this point. I said it. Farrakhan's Nation of Islam claims to have somewhere between five and 10,000 members. The message popularized by the late Malcolm X and shared by Farrakhan is that whites are devils and only blacks can straighten out this country. It's a philosophy leading to a separate black nation. But Farrakhan has joined the system temporarily to support his friend's presidential candidacy. Reverend Jackson, the next president of the United States. Those who are on the streets, the underclass, 
This is the kind of uh, crowd that uh, Minister Farrakhan can reach, and a crowd which uh, possibly uh, Jesse Jackson, uh, being a minister, uh, cannot reach. Before Jackson received Secret Service support, Farrakhan's Fruit of Islam guards protected him. Farrakhan shows up at Jackson rallies. Jackson shows up when Farrakhan registers to vote. And Farrakhan accompanied Jackson to Syria to negotiate for the release of Navy Lieutenant Robert Goodman. Farrakhan and Jackson, friends. Is a presidential candidate responsible for statements of a friend? I, do, I must not assume responsibility for things I don't know about. Finally, an attempt at putting an end to it all. I have a call from Milton Coleman, which I'm going to respond to. Uh, I've not talked with him for weeks. I have a call into Mr. Farrakhan because I respect the both of them, and I would hope that in, that in short order that, that these two very able and talented men could sit together and resolve this matter amicably. And this is what Farrakhan had to say about the press. He was speaking in St. Louis. The racism of America is manifest in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the St. Louis papers. The threat to um, uh, reporter Coleman really comes out of the belief in the nation of Islam in a final battle between blacks and whites, and that blacks finally will achieve this power. And it is sometime in the future that this, this retribution will come. Retribution against a reporter who happens to be black by blacks who think the reporter should be black first. When the charismatic Jesse Jackson spoke of his Rainbow Coalition, it was an idealistic, but hopefully realistic dream. The dream seems further away than ever, even though the Jackson candidacy is stronger than many would have predicted. Betsy Aaron for Nightline in New York. We'll talk live with black Muslim leader Louis Farrakhan when we return in just a moment. With us now live from our affiliate WVUE in New Orleans is Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam. Mr. Farrakhan, we heard what you said, so I guess the question is not over whether you said it, but what you meant. First, I'd like to say that uh, it is regrettable that after 30 years of service to the black community, I'm not before these cameras because of the good that I have done on behalf of black people, but I am here because of the wicked machinations of the media, both print and uh, television, who have twisted my words out of context, as was done just a few minutes ago, to make me appear as though I threatened the life of Mr. Coleman, which I never did. Well, first of all, now, Mr. Now, in Mr. answer Mr. to if, what you asked, yes, go ahead. What did I mean? I said that I felt that Mr. Coleman was guilty of betraying our brother and betraying our people in what he did. And as a betrayer of our people, I felt that he should be punished. And I felt that that punishment should take on the form of social pressure which ostracized or excommunicated him from among us, that we would not accept him in our community until he repented of what he did. Later on in that same tape, I said, in the future, or soon, you, you, plural, meaning traitors, stool pigeons, and those kinds of persons who are against the rise and liberation of our people will be punished with death, as any nation punishes their traitors. When we become a nation, then we will do as all nations do, punish our traitors. But that was not what I meant for Mr. Coleman, and I never said anything of that kind. All right. Let us then analyze, if we can, why it is you believe that he was a traitor. He is, after Certainly. all, he is, after all, a journalist working for a distinguished newspaper, and he reported what he heard. Yes, he reported what he heard, sir. But to us, we put it in a religious context. To us, we see the Reverend Jesse Jackson coming in the prophetic mold. He is not a prophet, but we see him coming in the mold of Jesus and the former prophets, seeking to redress the grievances of the poor and the oppressed, and crying out for justice. And we see this brother, Milton Coleman, as having heard a remark that Reverend Jesse Jackson made, 
and delivered this remark into the hands of those who were bent on destroying Reverend Jesse Jackson. So look at the way this Jaime remark has been blown totally out of proportion. While at the same time, sir, with all due respect, this remark and the way it was blown out of proportion caused certain members of the Jewish Defense League to bomb the offices of Mr. Jackson uh, in Anaheim, California. This was reported on the West Coast, but it was not reported on the East Coast. It was not reported in the Washington Post, nor in the New York Times. So we ask, why would you spread the term Jaime and then at the same time suppress a violent act which came as a result of their hatred of Jesse exacerbated by this remark becoming public and in the way that it was made public. Mr. Farrakhan, as you know, one of the things that the Reverend Jackson is trying to do is to create a rainbow coalition, as he calls it. He's looking for support, and lamentably, he's not getting much of it outside the black community. But do you think it is in keeping with that spirit that a black reporter be asked to act first as a black and second as a reporter? Do you think that he should be required to do his job differently than other members of his profession are asked to do theirs? On a recent show in New York City called Like It Is, a respected Jewish writer named Nat Hentoff said that when he writes an article on someone, he always asks their position on Israel. And once they give their position on Israel, then he takes his direction of how he will write that article based upon that. So he is a Jew first and a writer afterwards. And that is Mr. Most, and that is Mr. Hentoff's decision to make. That is Mr. Hentoff's that's decision. That's right. And what I'm, Mr. Asking, what I'm asking you, what I'm asking you, however, was born black and then became a reporter. So he was black first and is a reporter second. No doubt. But if every member of the profession of journalism were to act in that kind, were to act in that manner, then there would be no such thing as even approaching objective journalism, would there? Sir, in an article yesterday in the Washington Post, a respected journalist, Mr. Carl Rowan, said that if he were to have revealed certain conversations by judges and senators and whatnot, it would be very damaging and embarrassing to them. Out of his journalistic profession and out of his discretion as a journalist, he chose not to say those things that would be embarrassing to that judge or that senator or these high-ranking officials or White House officials. On the other hand, Mr. Jackson is running for an office that he has not yet attained. And the name Jaime, sir, was not known in the Jewish community as a slur. If Jesse Jackson had used the term kike or had used the term wop or any other name in that category or as another reporter said he lumped it in the name uh, with the name coon. We don't refer to ourselves as coons but Jewish people refer to each other as Hyman or Jaime and you know the name does not have a bad meaning. The name Jaime comes from an Hebrew a root called Chaim, which means life. And Jesse Jackson was using it not in the pejorative sense, but in the sense of a slang word. Unfortunate, though he used it, the, the way it was treated, sir, knowing it one month before it was revealed, and then revealing it eight days before the New Hampshire primary, and knowing this remark that I made concerning Milton Coleman one month ago, and holding it to reveal it two days before the New York primary, now whipping it up to damage Jesse Jackson in the Pennsylvania primary, I think this is the diabolical mischief-making of the press, which Mr. we deplore. Mr. Farrakhan, since we are in the primary season, and since just about every week now is the week before one primary or another, if it's going to be revealed at all before next November's election, I guess at some time or another it's going to be before a primary. That can't be avoided. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, uh, Roger Wilkins is going to join us. Mr. Farrakhan, I'd like to ask you if you'll be good enough to remain with us, will you? Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. 
With us now live in our New York studios is Roger Wilkins, author, radio commentator, former columnist for the New York Times, former editorial writer for the Washington Post, and former assistant attorney general. Where are we, Mr. Wilkins? Uh, is this a story that should have been written in the first place? Is too much being made of it now? Is it possible that this is being done as an effort to smear a presidential candidate? You've asked about nine questions, Ted. I... Just, just three. The answer is that um, when um, Earl Butts told his dirty joke on the airplane, um, somebody printed it, and uh, Earl Butts uh, ultimately was driven out of the cabinet. Um, and we blacks uh, were... Um, delighted that uh, the demonstration of a fellow's racism would be punished. Um, we cannot, it seems to me, um, say that when our friend uh, says something that is difficult and awkward, uh, that it should not be reported. Uh, so I don't think too much has been made of it. Um, the question really is uh, whether uh, Milton Coleman is being treated badly, um, is being uh, persecuted, being, uh, and whether he, whether he did um, what he did as a reporter uh, 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 who was covering a presidential candidate or whether he was being a black man covering a black presidential candidate and whether as a result he felt extraordinary pressures and did something um, that he would not otherwise have done. Well, you heard what Mr. Farrakhan had to say. He said he's a black man first and should have acted as a black man first and because he did not he should be regarded by the black community as a traitor. Now, whether in fact this business of uh, the you being singular or plural and the you will be punished with death refers to traitors in general or to Mr. Coleman in particular. I guess we have to leave to our audience to decide for themselves. But how does a... you are a black reporter, you are a black writer. Had it been you, how would you have responded? And how do you respond to Mr. Farrakhan now? If Jesse had said to me, Jesse is a friend of mine, and if he had said those words to me on the record, I would have printed them. If he had said to me, this is off the record, this is how I think about those people, I would have said to him, I'm not going to print that, Jesse. You shouldn't say that. Those are ugly words and those are ugly thoughts and they are dangerous. And if you say it again, I'll print it. Mr. Farrakhan, you're, you're nodding your head, and yet a moment ago you were explaining to me that there was nothing, there was nothing untoward in, in the expression of Jaime to begin with. Sir, this gentleman said, number one, that if it were on the record, he would have printed it. The remarks that Jesse Jackson made, to the best of our knowledge, was off the record. Secondly, he is kind enough and good enough to have said to his brother, you are wrong. And I will warn you, Jesse, not to say this again, for if you do, I will make it known. I think that's the brotherly thing to do. Mr. Coleman did not do that. He delivered his brother up into the hands of those who wanted to destroy him. Now, Mr. Uh, uh, excuse me, something excuse I... me for interrupting you both, because, because, Mr. Wilkins, I don't think you're being consistent. You began by pointing to the example of Earl Butts, who was Secretary of Agriculture, and who also thinking that he was speaking off the record, made, as, as you correctly pointed out, uh, or delivered a very distasteful joke. He thought it was off the record. It was reported, and because of that, he lost his cabinet post. Now, which is it? Does a man, I mean, do, did the reporters who were traveling with him have an obligation to say, hey, listen, Earl, that's a lousy joke. You shouldn't tell jokes like that, and if you do it again, I'm warning you that I will have to report it? We can't have a double standard there either, can we? Well, uh, Ted, you and I know that in Washington, people 
curry favor with reporters, cover, curry favor with public figures. And they are seduced by public figures all the time. The greatest example is Henry Kissinger, who seduced a whole generation of reporters in the early 70s. I believe that reporters ought to give their friends, because I think reporters are human beings, I think they ought to give their friends one bite at the apple and say, do not say that anymore in my presence. If you do, I've got to go and put that in the paper. All right. Now, what about what about what Mr. Farrakhan had to say to Mr. Coleman? You accept his explanation that it was a it was a broad statement and that he was not threatening him with, with no, violence. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, I respect Minister Farrakhan and his uh, uh, contributions to the black community, but I do not believe that if he meant to say to Milton Coleman that I have a right to tell you, Milton Coleman, how to do your job because I'm black and I like Jesse and I'm going to tell you how to do your job. I don't believe he can say that. I don't believe he has a right to say that just as I don't believe that we black people would accept it if a white person would say to us, um, we are going to make white reporters protect Jesse Holmes. If I may say, uh, sir, with all uh, due respect, you cannot compare the remark that Mr. Butts made. If you were to repeat what Mr. Buck Butts said on this television show and then compare that with Jaime or Jaime Town, that's like comparing apples and watermelons. Secondly, uh, with all respect again, sir, I'm not telling Mr. Coleman how to do his job. I am at advising him that this, in my judgment, and in the judgment of the masses of black people, is highly improper. Now, if I threaten this man's life, Mr. Koppel, why have I not been charged and arrested? Because that is a criminal offense. Here you are making of me a criminal, and our lawyers are looking into a suit against every network and every newspaper that said I threatened this man because we intend to make you prove this in a court of law. Mr. Farrakhan, it will be... Just a minute, sir. it will be... While you make... I'm sorry. Well, yes, go sir. ahead. You, you finish what you were going to say. While you make an assertion that is utterly false that I threatened this man's life, here there have been over 100 threats against the life of Reverend Jesse Jackson and over 10 Caucasians are now in jail for having threatened his life and nothing is made of the real threat but everything is made of this purported threat. Mr. Farrakhan, uh, first of all let me ask your indulgence for a moment. We're going to have to tell our affiliates now that we are going to be running a little bit long so please bear with us. You are a leader. When you make a statement and when you make it in a nationally broadcast uh, national radio broadcast, that has a different impact, and I think perhaps you will agree that you ought to be held to a different standard than some of the maniacs who are running around threatening not only Jesse Jackson, but all the presidential candidates and the man who lives in the White House. That kind of thing goes with the territory. But you're a leader. Certainly. I must be accountable for what I say, sir, and for what I do, as all of us in public life must be accountable. I never mentioned that this that I recommended this ostracism or this social pressure on Milton Coleman should be done to tell other black reporters that they should not be critical of Jesse Jackson. Certainly they should be critical of Reverend Jesse Jackson. Any of us that are in leadership or in the public eye should be criticized. But there is a difference between criticism and betrayal. And I would rather believe and suspect and I believe if you polled black people around this country, 90 to 95 percent of our people would agree that Milton Coleman betrayed Jesse Jackson into the hands of those who wanted to destroy his candidacy. Mr. Farrakhan, I, when, when you say that, that uh, you're not threatening other black reporters, I can't disagree with that, but don't you think it has a chilling effect on other black reporters? when, they see, Sir, how, when all, they see how stridently you come out against Mr. Coleman? 
I would hope that it would have a chilling effect on betrayers because we live in a society, Mr. Copper, we've just come through the 60s where J. Edgar Hoover had this terrible counterintelligence program where black men and women were paid sums of money to disrupt black organizations, to discredit black leaders and to destroy black church people who were deemed too militant. And I feel that if black people hope in a reward from the establishment for the betraying of blacks, that equation has never been balanced. Now with an enlightened black community, we hope to add something to that other side of the equation so that blacks who want to curry the favor and ingratiate themselves to the establishment and take bribes to do these evil things to us, then we on the other side will balance that with punishment. Ted, After all, we're coming Ted, of age. Ted, can I, can I say something? Please. Um, Jesse does not need that kind of help. Uh, Jesse is a very strong, able, assertive man. Um, he has proved that uh, in Alabama, Georgia, and New York. We do not, we black people, need the kind of help that Minister Farrakhan is saying that he needs. It is as if when Jackie Robinson came into the league, if the Giants had uh, hired a black pitcher um, and somebody said, well, don't throw him your fastest fastball. Jesse doesn't need the help of black reporters not being as professional, not being as tough, not being as examining of what he's doing as they are of heart and Mondale, he can stand the gaff. He's a strong, bright, able, assertive guy. How do you, and this is an awfully difficult position for you to be in, but how do you respond to what Mr. Farrakhan has been saying if he were to turn around to you right now, and of course he has not, but if he did and said, sure, you're saying that because you now are currying favor with the white establishment. It is an almost impossible position, it seems to me, for a black reporter to be put in the position of either being regarded as a traitor or as, as currying favor with, uh, with the white establishment. Mr. Is, is, there, happens, is there no middle ground? It happens that I am delighted by what Jesse Jackson is doing and my heart leaps at his successes. But it does not seem to me that the black people who support Walter Mondale, uh, of whom there are many, are betraying the black people. It is not a measure of your blackness or your uh, love of black people, your, your, your respect for uh, the aged black people or your respect for black children that you love Jesse Jackson and what he is doing. Um, that is one judgment that people have a right to make. I made the judgment that I approve of what uh, Jesse Jackson is doing. You are not betraying black people by deciding that you are for Walter Mondale or Gary Hart or something else. You are not betraying black people by looking at Jesse Jackson whole and not saying he is complete, total, perfect. You, you, it, it, it's, it's just wrong All right, to Mr. say. Mr. Farrakhan, if I may say, sir. Do you, do you have any trouble with that? Uh, yes, I do. In a recent poll taken by the Haddon Associates, a marketing research firm out of Haddon, New Jersey, they called the Wellington Group, they asked the question to black people across this country in 50 uh, major cities, do you regard those blacks who go with Mondale as opposed to those who go with Jesse as betraying the cause of black people and not speaking the will of black people. And 49 and 6 tenths percent of those polled said they agreed that if they went with Mondale, they were betraying the masses of the people. 36 percent of those polled were neutral. 
and only 14 and one tenth percent of those polled said they disagreed totally. What we're saying with respect to Mr. Mondale, if we look at Mr. Hart and Mr. Mondale and the Jewish constituency, if you notice with six million Jews in America, a very powerful, politically and economically mature people, Mr. Hart and Mr. Mondale have to stand before the Jewish people and stand before the Jewish leaders and speak forthrightly on Jewish concerns before they will get the vote of the Jewish people. Here we are endorsing Mondale or endorsing Hart and we have never called Hart or Mondale before black people to address our concerns. Why should we be so quick to endorse Mr. Mondale or to endorse Mr. Hart or to endorse Mr. Jackson until and unless these political candidates show they respect our vote and speak out against our concerns? Mr. Farrakhan, concerns we're, we're, very legitimate. we're going to have to begin wrapping this up, but I think there are a couple of loose ends that have to be wrapped up. First of all, do you agree with that, with that survey, with that poll that would describe anyone who voted for Mr. Mondale, any black who voted for Mr. Mondale or Mr. Hart as a traitor? Is, is, would, would, would that be oh, part of that group? They didn't use the word trade, a traitor. As betraying. That betrayed our betraying. cause. All right. One yeah. who betrays, I think, can reasonably be called a traitor. You did the same thing in your radio, in your radio comments. Would you, would you consider such a person as betraying the black people? No. A person that voted for Mondale out of what they call their pragmatic sense, who felt that Mr. Mondale could do more for them, I would call that their vote and their right to do so. But all I'm saying, sir, is that before we give Mr. Mondale our endorsement, make him address the concerns of the people who voted these politicians into office. And no black leading politician has done this. And for that, we hold them accountable. All right. One more question I would like to ask you, since you raised the issue of some of the frictions that exist between Jews and blacks today in America, and since it can reasonably be argued that you contributed to some of that friction when you said, if you harm this brother, this will be the last one you harm. What did you mean by that? Was that a threat? Yes, it was a threat, but it was more a warning. You know, when the prophets spoke to Israel, they always spoke to Israel and gave Israel a warning. Implicit in that warning was a threat that the Israeli conduct would lead to this consequence. What I was saying to the Jewish people, and mind you, it was taken out of context, because before that, I had asked the Jews and blacks to sit down and dialogue. This is what I asked. But I said that if Jesse Jackson is harmed, this man has transcended Jesse Jackson. He's on a higher mission from a higher power, and if this man is harmed, you will have to face the wrath of God. This is what I meant, and I mean that today. Mr. Ted, Farrakhan, thank Ted, you very much. Roger, I, go ahead. If you yeah, want to... I, uh, there, I cannot let this end that way. I do not um, contest Minister Farrakhan's um, support for Reverend Jackson. Um, I simply say that uh, Reverend Jackson is also a friend of mine. And I support what he is doing. Uh, I have uh, given of uh, my time and my spirit and my intellect uh, to promote his effort. And I do not see in anything that he is doing um, anything that calls for a test um, of Jewish people. Anything that says to Jewish people, um, you uh, have to prove to us something of, uh, of uh, yourselves. I see uh, Reverend Jackson really as a, a person who uh, um, is pushing as hard as he can and growing as rapidly as he can uh, for uh, 
expression of issues of human concern in this society, uh, both human domestically and human uh, abroad, uh, that are beyond uh, race, uh, beyond religion, um, and uh, certainly beyond any of this um, silly business of um, Jews and blacks. I, I, I think Reverend Jackson wants to get beyond that. I think he's tried to get beyond that. I think he's made some mistakes. Um, I think that the angry talk um, that um, we have heard uh, uh, over the last few weeks, and the angry talk we've heard tonight, um, may have been where this campaign was some time ago. I don't think that's where my friend Jesse Jackson is tonight. I no. just don't think so. Gentlemen, we have to stop somewhere, and that is... I'd like to say, sir, that I have Ms. initiated Farrakhan, a meeting with Nathan Perlmutter, and it will take place sometime this month to sit down and, con and start that kind of dialogue. Nathan and I'm Perlmutter also going anti, to have a meeting with Milton meeting. Coleman. Yeah. When, are you, you. when are you going to meet with Mr. Coleman? Uh, we're going to meet hopefully on Monday morning. Uh, and where? In Washington, D.C. All right. Mr. Farrakhan, Mr. Wilkins, thank you both very much. Thank you. In a moment, we'll talk with Kenneth Walker, our ABC News correspondent covering the Jackson campaign. Joining us now from our affiliate WTAE in Pittsburgh, ABC News correspondent Kenneth Walker, who has been covering the Jackson campaign. Ken, let me ask you a, a more personal question. Is it awkward for you in any sense? Is it difficult for you in any sense as a black correspondent covering a black presidential candidate? Well, it's become difficult in the sense that it's become strained lately, Ted. But when I was first assigned to cover the Jackson campaign, it became clear to me that there was a lot of emotional investment in him in the black community. And I made a judgment very early on that in order for... Uh, if, if the Jackson campaign was going to succeed at all, it had to do so and had to be viewed as doing so under the same set of rules that have applied to other presidential candidates. And that if he failed under that test, then that was good for black people. And what is good for black people, frankly, is important to me. And if he succeeded under that test, that was fine. But I in no way felt at any time during the campaign that Jackson being black and my being black affected my duty as a reporter. In the course of my career as a reporter, I've written stories that have launched grand jury investigations against respected black political figures. Some have been cost elections, I've been told, by things that I've printed. So that's not of concern to me. What has happened lately is that in the whole context of, of these charges we've been discussing now for, I guess, 45 minutes, there's, there's, there's been a considerable strain, frankly, on black reporters on the campaign in light of aspersions that are being cast in light of impressions that have been formed that I think are wholly inaccurate. I think, I'm glad to hear that Minister Farrakhan did, n did not intend to threaten Mr. Coleman because I think that uh, to threaten a reporter is frankly deplorable. Uh, but having said that, I think that open and uh, vigorous discussion of how reporters work is useful in general and necessary in this case. I think that as a reporter, if you leave aside the question of off-the-record discussions for a minute, as a reporter, if I hear an ethnic slur from a presidential candidate, I am obligated to publish or broadcast it promptly, uh, forthrightly, and fully. And I don't think that Mr. Coleman did that in this case. He has yet to publish under his own name any account of this entire episode. And I think after he gave the information to another reporter to publish, he then later on justified breaking what he called an off-the-record confidence by claiming that Mr. Jackson had made these slurs to other black reporters. That simply is not true. But while there are, while we certainly cannot abide any intimidation, these are very serious issues that the Farrakhan statement or its interpretation had, had come to obscure. And I think that uh, uh, black journalists all over the country, the New York Black Journalist Association, this very night is debating these issues, these very serious ethical issues about the handling of this whole of this whole case all right one one quick final question to you ken in the absence of someone stating something is off the record and this is not a black white issue i'm asking you this just as a reporter in the absence of someone stating this is an off the record conversation is it to be assumed that it is off the record absolutely no 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 it's, it's for my purposes you have to make explicitly clear that you are off the record if you don't 
So far as I'm concerned, you're on. All right. Ken Walker, thanks very much. Thank you, Ted. Tomorrow morning, ABC News will have coverage of a launch of the space shuttle. That coverage beginning at 8.54 Eastern Time during Good Morning America. And tomorrow on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, a report from correspondent Gary Shepard on the growing problem of child abuse. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in New York. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.